Please be seated. <clears throat> when, um, when, when times are bad, it's quite helpful to have something to set against what's going wrong. Those occasions, all too often, I think, recently for too many, all too many people, those, those occasions when life seems difficult or boring or hopeless, or those days when you're just totally lacking in energy, perhaps because you haven't had much of the usual stimulation which you need to keep you going. There's that sort of dreariness which has set in to the lives of so many of us over the last 15 months or so. A sense of repetition and not being able to go out with a sense of pervasive anxiety which is somehow crippling and takes one's energy away especially on a day like this, which is dull and overcast. Moments like that, it's really helpful to have a positive image to feed on, to set before your mind. One of the great images which gives me a huge sense of hope or sustenance, one of those images which I find I can feed on when I'm feeling low or depressed or lacking energy, is precisely the one in today's Gospel, the feeding of the 5,000. As Father Andrew said in his introduction to the service, it's a wonderful example of how one person's generosity can feed so many people. And this, this story, which is about feeding, I find feeds me psychologically as much as the people there, the 4,000, the 5,000 people, would have been fed physically. This is a story that I, can, that I can feed off, that gives me hope, that gives me energy. Here are these people in the wilderness, 5,000 of them, with no food, 
And Jesus says, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? To test his disciples. Andrew comes up and says, there's a small boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what is that among so many? And the five barley loaves and the two fish miraculously feed the whole crowd. A wonderful image of God's generosity. God outpouring his love and his gracious gifts to his people, even there in the desert. So it's a great image when you're feeling anxious or in need of some kind of imaginative feeding. For the people of Jesus' day, it wouldn't perhaps have been much of a surprise as it is to us. The, the first reading we had today from two kings. You may remember that when they put the lectionary together, very often the first reading, the Old Testament reading, sheds light on the Gospel. And today's first reading does exactly that. Elisha was one of the great Hebrew prophets, Elijah and Elisha, two folk heroes of the Old Testament about whom many stories were told throughout the Bible. Elisha was a kind of, as well as being a prophet, was a miracle worker, a wonder worker. And this is one of the stories told about him we had in Two Kings this morning. A man comes from Baal Shalisha and he brings Elisha 20 barley loaves and fresh grain in the ear. And with this, Elisha feeds a hundred people. So it was well known, this would have been a well known story at Jesus' time. He was one of the great heroes of the Old Testament, feeding people miraculously out of simply 20 barley loaves, he fed a hundred people. So people would have known this lovely story about Elisha, one of the great Old Testament heroes. And so when Jesus went on to do much the same, it was saying that Jesus was a hero in the mould of Elisha and Elijah, saying that Jesus was a miracle worker in the same tradition as these great heroes of the Old Testament. So Jesus is firmly placing himself in that great tradition of Old Testament prophets with which his hearers would have been familiar. We all love a story of um, something miraculous going on, especially when performed by a powerful person such as Elijah or Elisha. And so transferring this to Jesus gave Jesus' disciples a sense that yes, Jesus was somebody special, a real prophet, Old Testament style. There's a second passage from the Old Testament though which also reflects on this wonderful gospel today, which gives it extra resonance and depth when we're looking to feed on it. And that's Isaiah 25 which we quite often have here at funerals. It's a description of the great banquet that God is going to prepare for his people at the end of time. At the end of time, according to Elisha, on his holy mountain, God will prepare for all nations a great banquet, a banquet of fine food and of good wine strained on the lees. Um, Nothing very teetotal, I'm afraid, about the banquet at the end of the world. There's going to be wine for everybody, and there's going to be really good wine as well, according to Isaiah. So there's something to look forward to. Um, I imagine in paradise you don't get hangovers either, so I suppose, who knows, I imagine the great feast at the end of the world, that celestial banquet, is going to be quite a party. So there's Isaiah predicting that at the end of the world there will be a celestial banquet with food for all and wine for all. I'm, I'm sure there will be soft drinks, don't worry, for those who really don't like wine. I'm sure our Lord will provide soft drinks for those who, who really don't like the taste of, of alcohol. But that's the point. There is Jesus in the wilderness feeding his people in much the same way as Isaiah predicts that at the end of time... God will feed the whole world, all his people, all nations. And so when Jesus feeds the people in the wilderness, he is in a sense anticipating what's going to happen at the end of the world, 
at the end of time. Jesus is kind of being pictured in this way as a kind of messiah figure, the one who brings in the end time, the one who gives us a glimpse, a foretaste of how it's going to be when God's kingdom comes. And so as well as seeing Jesus as an Elisha figure, someone able to feed, do miraculous feedings, we also see Jesus as a figure prophetic of the coming of God's kingdom, a first glimpse of how things will be when paradise arrives. So plenty there to feed on. There's only one slight nagging doubt, isn't there, at the back of one's mind. Christians are often accused, dare I say it, not just Christians, religious people in general perhaps, accused of a sort of naive optimism. Those of you who are fans of the life of Brian may remember the last scene where all the crucified people are singing, let's all look on the bright side of life. You may remember it's a wonderful parody of the naive optimism of lots of religious people. We say, oh, everything is going to be fine, everything is going to be fine. And those for whom things aren't fine find that really very difficult to take. What makes you so smug, they might say. It's fairly easy to counter this charge of naive optimism, I think, thinking about this feeding of the 5,000. Because there was another banquet which Jesus hosted of a very different nature. You may remember on the last night of his life in the upper room, Jesus also hosted a banquet, hosted a supper, hosted a meal. It wasn't in the desert, and there were just him and the twelve disciples present. And Jesus hosted this meal, and there were no barley loaves this time. There was unleavened bread. And he was celebrating the Passover, and he took the bread and said, This is my body, broken for you. And gave it to his disciples. And they ate, and they were fed. And Jesus went out the following day, and physically gave his body to be crucified. And only on Easter day, three days later, did he rise from the dead. The banquet of the Last Supper, a very different banquet from the feeding of the 5,000 in the wilderness, can't be accused in any sense of naive optimism. This was real. This was real giving, real generosity. Generosity that took account of the vast sinfulness of human nature, of the appalling things that can go wrong, and carried on regardless. So firmly rooted was Jesus in the love of God. And thanks to that final banquet, the banquet of the Last Supper, which we ourselves share this morning, and every time we come to church, we get a foretaste of paradise. Not in the easy sense of being invited to a meal with lots of food and lots of wine, but in the much more difficult sense of being invited to a meal which takes account of our sin and our weakness, of our pain, of our suffering, of the damage we've caused to other people, of the evils we've done to ourselves. This banquet takes account of all that and transforms our negativities, transforms our sins and our sufferings, our pain and our grief, and turns them into love. Just as nature can take leaves and vegetable peelings and turn them into fresh new soil. So God's love, as we feed on Christ's body and blood, takes the old potato peelings of our life, those parts which we've discarded, those parts which are sinful and suffering, and turns them into new life. Our sin is turned into love, and through this great banquet, we get a foretaste of God's love, triumphant now and triumphant too.
to the end of time. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, protector of all those who hope in you, without whom nothing has firm foundation and nothing is holy, bestow in abundance your mercy upon us and grant that with you as our ruler and guide we may use the good things that pass in such a way as to hold fast even now to, the, to those that ever endure. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be God.